Hey. Hey, come on. Did you like that? Hey. Like that. It's yeah, yeah. Episode 32. Uh -huh. uh, Alex and Jim analyze Billy Joel lyrics. And you know what that means. Yep, the 30 second caller. Is that what it means? Yes, the 30 second caller. Gets to listen to it. It's <laughs> <laughs> yes. a great prize because everybody else can too, but. But you will know why you got yeah. special access. Exactly. We were all out of Billy Joel koozies. <laughs> they go fast. Yeah, they really do. That's an old stand-up reference, by the way, is if you want to make fun of radio, you talk about beer koozies. And I never understood it because I never listened to that much radio. Oh, I listened to a lot of radio, but I stopped a very long time ago, so I don't know what radio is now. Yeah. But I feel like it's no ads or no, yeah, it's like satellite. Well, so two things radio is, it's satellite or close to unnecessary. Yeah. But there is still commercial radio and it has not changed a bit. That's great. It there, should not. Yeah. There is still a lady and a man who think that they're both very funny. Uh-huh. And the man always has some some crazy, you know, like it's horse face and Diane. And <laughs> right. For some reason she never has a nickname. But he always has a nickname. Yeah. Is, uh, women respect themselves too much. So it's Dingleberry and Betty. Yeah. Here's Pile of Shit and Linda. <laughs> it's the morning traffic. I'll tell you something, though. I always listen to Pile of Shit and uh, Linda, though. Because I was always, Pile of Shit was so funny. He played those clips. Plus, he's got a lot of good points about the vaccine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For sure, oh God, I got to imagine all of talk radio, even rock and roll DJs are just now and then going, and we're going to be down there uh, giving away free stuff. I won't be wearing a mask. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot of that. I made it this far. Yeah, six the six caller is going to get free tickets unless you're on Antifa and then no tickets. <laughs> we're giving away Black Rifle coffee. I'm mad at Antifa for some reason. I didn't put together that anti and fascist is a good thing. <laughs> Comes our super tramp double play. And don't forget, blue lives matter. <laughs> what? Come on. Uh, well, I do like super tramp, so I want to stick around. <laughs> I want to stick around. I'm going to be mad. <laughs> So last week you uh, you dropped a bomb, uh, not which is not the song we're talking about, but you said you you had to you wanted to talk about a song that you've been putting off because it resonates with you, and I yeah. and uh, related to probably a real relationship that you had that at the time you heard the song you were like, ah crap. Yeah, oh crap. Yeah, this is the the same thing is happening to me. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I only have one question. Did I know this lady? You knew about this lady. Okay. Because it's about the same lady that the song is about. Okay. If you know what I'm saying. I do. There is a, I feel I'm uh, beating around the bush because there's a reveal in the song. There's a, uh, I, there's a spoiler possibility. Yeah. Because for a long time, you think the song is about a certain type of person or a certain relationship. And then it's revealed near the end of the song. You're like, oh, that's a different type of relationship entirely. Yeah. Now I have to rethink everything that already was said about this person and run it through a new filter <laughs> that, that makes it way sadder. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I that any makes sense to you? Yes. Have you ever noticed that this any filter that makes things sadder are always really Cameo. efficient? Hi, Sue. Unpaid. Like a filter you, that makes the makes, a line. No. We'll keep it that way. Our budget. We're really way over budget. This is we a really 
That's why we're doing a bottle episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no talking. <laughs> oh, there, go, there goes episode 33. <laughs> Which now will have to be recorded on my phone because oh. <laughs> we, we have to sell our laptops to pay for it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. You know, have you ever had this? Let me ask you this. Have you ever had yeah. a song? So you've had a song that was an R song, right? Sure. Like for you and a girl and probably a number of them, I'm sure. Sure. And, uh, have you ever had a song that you were like, oh, this is perfect. And then way after you had not seen the person anymore, you were like, did she ever think this was our song? Because you realize the song just reminded you of her. Yeah. We never actually listened to it together. Yes. Oh, certainly. Uh, and there were a lot of songs that were like, oh, this is our song because like we heard it together on a great date. Yeah. And then later you listen to the song and you're like, oh, this is not about <laughs> relationships or anything. Yeah. It's like a song that's like, oh, she's, it's a lady singing about a horse that she liked. <laughs> it has nothing to do with dating a woman. Right. We happened to hear it at the same time and we liked each other. And yeah, and the girl I was seeing at one point in my life, uh, there was the Call Me Maybe by Carly Rae Jepsen. And it had a very funny context for when we enjoyed it because she was a musician. And mm -hmm. I was like, I think you're going to have to make peace with the fact that my music taste is terrible. And, ah. and she thought that was funny. And I mentioned, I said, for example, I, I kind of like this song, Carly Rae Jepsen. And then she decided she liked it because she thought it was so dumb and ridiculous that I liked it. So great. Yep. That all worked out. And it's perfect because now that song can come on and it's so silly and everybody's like, well, why is Jim bummed out? I guess he <laughs> doesn't like bad music. No, no, actually, I love bad music. I'll tell you, there was a song that um, in high school, I was in ROTC. So we had the prom, of course, but then we also had the military ball, <laughs> which was like the ROTC prom. And you would wear your dress uniform and it was very much like the prom. And I brought this girl that I really liked and she very much thought like, we're just friends, but I'll go to this thing. And I thought, yay, this is going to be love forever. Hmm. And uh, we had a very nice slow dance to this song that then every time I heard it, I became engorged <laughs> emotionally. Sure. You know, like, oh, that was the time that we, and um, every time I heard it, I would listen to the lyrics and it just has nothing to do. And the song was uh, Leader of the Band. Oh, which is band a great Vogelbaum, song. Which is, like, he's like sad about his father dying or something. I don't know what's happening in the song. Yeah, he but is. very much not like a slow dancing, falling in love song. Um, I'll do this as a bonus if you listen to our show regularly. I'll break down the lyrics of that quickly. What it's about is his dad his dad was also a musician. Ah, uh, right. And he's no longer with us, but his song leaves lives in my memory. And he's like, I, I'm trying to live up to the standard you set, and I'm pursuing music too, just right. like you, Pop. Yeah, it's like a little cat in the cradle yeah. thing. Um, but we were slow dancing <laughs> in, in my military uniform at 17 years old. Right. I thought it was the most romantic thing <laughs> ever. Uh, yeah. Oh, Colleen Kelleher, if you're listening. <laughs> Probably. I think she's uh, dating Bruno Mars now, so. Oh, right. Well, you know, good for both of them. Yeah, absolutely. They're a good couple, you know. Yeah. She deserves to uh, tour <laughs> and wait backstage. <laughs> so, so I'll say this about uh, Laura. Actually, I'm going to let you tell me what you think first because it's your pick and obviously more personal. Uh, the music's interesting. Uh, it's a, how would you describe it? The music? Yeah. 
Um, I would describe it first as a melange of things he stole from the Beatles. Yeah. There's a lot of like the vocal, uh, whatever they're doing production wise with the vocals is very Beatley uh, from a few different songs. Um, musically, I don't know how to describe it because I, like you, I don't know enough about actual music. So it came across to me as, I don't know if this is the right word, but sort of, it's not stripped down. That's not what I'm thinking of because that's no. what you mean when people go acoustic. But yeah. it seems somewhat minimalist for what he's in a and a little staccato yeah definitely that a little cold yeah kind of barren barren's a good word yeah yeah it's a it reminds me of scandinavian skies because it is a melody but it is a not a pretty melody yeah um it's yeah it's tensed yeah yes and so i had this conversation with a friend of mine a friend of mine who doesn't give a lick about lyrics at mm -hmm. all he only cares about the sound and i am i like lyrics a lot yeah and there are some songs where both things are going on important like the lyrics are important but the music's really nice and then there's some songs where it's like Oh, I finally heard the lyrics. Man, that's stupid. But it's a great song. Right. This, to me, seems like he's like, I want to make sure you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yes, this is very clear. And uh, it is a well-written. Yeah. I feel like it's very, there's no, none of his... Uh, bravado and bluster that no. we normally get he's in a very bad mood it's very venomous yeah um but it is clear writing with not a lot of tricks yeah it's like hey this relationship is bad for these reasons yeah uh, <laughs> uh yeah the only thing yet you know, there's a couple of places where he holds a note and it's basically a hiss yeah yeah he's uh, mad for sure <laughs> um yeah and i'll, like, I'll bet this would be one of the songs where his anger is justified just because it feels like the lyrics come from somewhere yeah it's not a song where he's better or smarter than somebody and he's like scoffing yeah he's like this person hurts me on a regular basis and i'm very very mad about it yeah and here are some details about that. Here's here's why I'm effing mad. Yeah, I feel like I there's you know, I'll, I'll say this up front. I'll I'll do the spoiler. It sounds like he's talking about a girlfriend for the longest time, <laughs> for the longest time, uh, and then it becomes clear that he's talking about his mother, which um, I have a mother who ha is a narcissist like a severe narcissist. And one of the hallmarks of that is they will treat you like a partner. They'll talk to you and share their problems with you like they are your partner because they don't have boundaries. Yeah. They don't say, well, this is not something I should burden my son with. I will keep it to myself or I'll talk to someone my own age. They are like, you're my boyfriend. <laughs> like they don't they will call you up and complain about something that happened in a way that makes you feel like, are we dating? Right. Um, so I think it's an interesting and probably accidental parallel that he wrote this song. So it sounds like a girlfriend for the longest time. And then it, you're like, oh, it's his mother he's talking about. Oh, no wonder he's mad. Your mother can't tell you this shit. <laughs> can't treat you like this. A girlfriend can, but not for very long, probably. Yeah, I remember. Um, like, oh, he's trapped. Yeah. He can't break up with this person. <laughs> he has to wait her out. <laughs> a good, there was a good uh, school of philosophy that says that you don't have to. But 
philosophers also don't. Yeah. Good luck. Contend with feelings. So, yeah. Is or it, narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah. Yeah. Lord. All right. <laughs> That's Have great. we gotten 32 calls yet? <laughs> All right. Let's do this. I'm, uh, I'm going to let you start. <laughs> okay. Laura, right away. I think it's very interesting that the name is the first word in the song. Yeah. Laura calls me in the middle of the night, passes on her painful information. Then these careless fingers, they get caught in her vice till they're bleeding on my coffee table. I'll stop there. Wow. Um, I like the idea of these careless fingers, like instead of like, he made a mistake <laughs> somewhere in the phone call. Yeah. I was like, Oh, well, uh, tell me more or something. Or like, no, I'm not busy. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Got caught in her vice. Yeah. Um, there's another song where someone there's he's, there are a lot of women making him bleed in songs. Yeah. What am I thinking of? She's always a woman. Oh, oh, uh, stiletto, maybe. Stiletto, maybe. Yeah. She'll laugh while you're bleeding. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Always a woman to me. Now, in that song, she's making somebody else bleed. Right. And he's like, ha ha, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no such luck here. Yeah. But I mean, it really starts off with a scene. She's call, she calls me in the middle of the night, passes on her painful information. Yeah. Painful to her, to him, probably both. Yeah. Um, so she's just passing on information. Then these careless fingers get caught in her vice till they're bleeding on my coffee table. So- I did like the inclusion of a coffee table. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so she's it's, it's very, it just places him, uh, like it's very lofty language. And then all of a sudden you can just see him sitting on his couch yeah. on the phone over a coffee table. And you're like, oh yeah, I know that scene. Yeah. In a conversation that was about four hours longer than it was intended to be. It's very inappropriate for your mother to call you in the middle of the night to tell you yeah. how sad she is. Yeah. Yeah. That's my opinion. I, I think you're, I think if it's a one-off event, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, if her dog died. Yeah. Whatever. But uh, the neuro neurotic kind of pain. Yeah. That, you know, is very likely self-generated. Yeah. Don't report that in the middle of the night. Damn. All right. So she's got blood on the coffee table. Uh -huh. Living alone isn't all that it's cracked up to be. I'm on her side. Why does she push the poison on me? This uh, seems like she uh, is recently divorced. Yeah. I, you know, I thought about it. I was like, living alone isn't all. I was like, wait, who's living alone? Now, I wondered for a second if, because the way I sort of read that line is it also could be living alone isn't all that it's cracked up to be. I live on my own place and I still can't get a break from her. Yeah. I might as well live at home if this is yeah. how it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good interpretation as well. And I... I and like, her, uh, go ahead sorry oh i just like that i'm on her side yeah like um that also makes me think like oh there's been a divorce i think because we know a little bit about his bio yeah we know there was a divorce that uh his dad was not cool about and certainly his mother probably was in pain yeah but i'm on her side why does she push the poison on me and I could, yeah, I th you definitely have been in that situation where, well, I mean, I'm, I'm now I kind of get that for sure you've been in that situation where 
Yeah. Somebody was like, you know, you're all like that. And don't tell me you're any different. That kind of shit where you're like, you know, it's bad enough that you're telling me, but that you, this thing happened to you or you're feeling this way, but now you're also kind of projecting that I'm the villain while yeah. I have to listen to you. Yes. I mean, have you ever been in a position where your mother is in a horrible mood and screaming and telling you how shitty men are? Right. And you're like, first of all, yes, mostly true. <laughs> um, but it's very weird to have your mother telling you, a man, how shitty men are. Yeah. And trying to maintain some kind of self-esteem for your own self. Um, it's similar. My mother also used to say, <laughs> She would say uh, when she got frustrated, don't, she would say, do everything in life you want to do before you have children. Because once you have children, you can't do anything. And I would go, and then she would many years later call up and go, when are you having children? I'm like, well, I'm not going to, <laughs> because I still have things I want to do. Yeah. And you made it really sound terrible. And as long as I have one thing I want to do. I can't have children because I have to go to the botanical gardens. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah, they do make it rough sometimes, don't they? Yeah. Look, I've had a couple of beers. That's perfect. That is perfect. It'll have to do. All right, you're up, my friend. You me. Laura has a very hard time. All her life has been one long disaster. Then she tells me she suddenly believes she's seen a very good sign. She'll be taking some aggressive action. Well, that's weird. Yeah. That's a bipolar, right? <laughs> it's a bipolar. It might just be standard issue mood swings. Yeah. Um, I think it's very typical when you have a, a a depressed parent or an angry parent for them to occasionally go, hey, I got it all together. Yeah. I'm taking a pottery class and everything's going to be great now. Uh, and you know, listening to them, like, you're going to be screaming tomorrow. Yeah. Something's going to go wrong at pottery class. <laughs> Um, so I understand the apprehension of even when some your parent is giving you good news, this kind of parent, you're like, yeah, this ain't gonna last. Yeah. Yeah. My, my ver the version in my house was um, sobering up. And ah, yeah. Not going to do that again. Right. And, and drunk. And, and then eventually there was a time she wasn't going to do that again. And the funny thing was, I have a vivid memory of just being really good. My timing throughout my entire life has been brilliant because my mother would drink and then she'd say she wasn't going to drink again, but she would. And then one time I yelled at her because I was like, you're just going to go drink, get drunk again. And my, my mom was like, I've been sober six months. I'm going to meetings. <laughs> And probably what was really going on is that my young mind recognized this was a moment I could say stuff I wished I could have said before without uh, getting hit or something. Oh, so interesting. Was kind of funny that it was like, you know, you're just, oh, actually, you're not. Yeah, you're going to the meetings now. So. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But if I had said this when you were drinking, you would have punched me in the face. My friend of mine and I have been talking talk about 12 step group uh, meetings and how one of them is to make amends. Right. And there's always somebody, myself included, who was like, so uh, I wasn't on the list. <laughs> um, you seem I, to think we're cool. <laughs> I, John Mulaney has a very funny bit in his stand, new stand up about that sort of thing. And um, he's saying, like, you know, a lot of a lot of people don't realize it's like step nine. So he's like, I got a lot of people coming to me early. <laughs> like, I'm in step four. And they're like, aren't you going to do the thing? <laughs> like, I'm not there yet. Um, which I didn't realize. I thought that was like early on. But it's apparently pretty deep into the program. I guess that makes sense, too. Because if you put it second, you'd do it wrong. 
Yeah. Yeah. Or you'd have too high an expectation of it. Because the other thing is, it's got to be at a point where if you're really working the program, that you make peace with the fact that I'm going to make amends, they might not forgive me. Right. That's too much pressure to put on somebody who quit drinking a week ago. Yeah. So yeah, that makes it makes sense that it's placed where it should be. Yeah. But I, I have known, I'd say a hundred addicts and alcoholics and nobody's called me ever. (laughs) Um, Which is fine. Yeah. I, I don't think I'm mad at any of them. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I would just, I think my mom should have said a few things. <laughs> just <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, if it's family, yes, it feels like you should be higher in the phone call rotation. At the very least, hey, remember that uh, birthday where you said you didn't want to have kids? You wished you didn't have them, I mean? That was bad. Anything there? That was, I, I remember it. <laughs> right. And that's all that really matters. But then again, to her credit, she probably didn't apologize for that because she for sure was blackout drunk. Yeah. Yeah. There's 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 some problems with the making amends because you got to remember (laughs) blackouts. Yeah, you might not know how many amends you owe. Yeah. I will say it's not a perfect system. (laughs) I think they admit that. A very good sign she'll be taking some aggressive action. I also like the word aggressive here because uh-huh. it's so extreme, the good thing. She's she's hella diving into pottery class. She wants you to go. She made you a dumb thing she wants you to put on her mantle. Oh, yeah. Nothing but uh, fucking poorly made pots on her Facebook all of a sudden. Yeah. Lots of owls or whatever. And you're like, yeah, okay. All right, this will uh, give it three weeks. I fight her wars while she's slamming her doors in my face. Oof. Again, yeah. Failure to break was the only mistake that she made. Wait that one I'm baffled on. I don't know what failure to break was. It's the only mistake that she made. Now, is this her contention that failing like which kind of breaking yeah failure to break off the marriage earlier yeah failure to completely collapse and to try to hang on instead it could be just in as i'm roughly grappling with it because obviously with such a personal set of lyrics that it's hard to say but Failure to break down completely was the only mistake that she made. Could be like literally failure to completely collapse, to completely right. give in because it isn't until you do that that you can then. Uh, the actually, rock bottom theory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, yes, I, it's very unclear for sure in the context of the song what he's trying to say. Yeah. Um, but that's my, I think that's my favorite interpretation is that, um, yeah, she tried to hang on and make it seem like everything was okay when she should have just fully broken down and allowed whatever healing and repair needed to happen to come into play. Yeah. Um, instead of trying to convince everybody everything was all right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's a great lyric. It's a great lyric. You know, in, this, to hell. in this particular case, the inability to grasp exactly what he means is a benefit. Yeah. Because because this this these lyrics, by the way, come across as really good spew. Like I don't think it's like labor intensive. <laughs> yeah, this might be a second or third draft, but not yeah. much deeper than that. Yeah, this was a moment of emotional devastatingly emotional clarity yeah and this i think this next part is definitely the fully angriest part yeah here i am feeling like a fucking fool i think it, it definitely is only f word in his whole 12 studio albums yeah 
do I react the way exactly she intends me to? Every time I think I'm off the hook, she makes me lose my cool. I'm her machine and she can punch all the keys. She can push any button I was programmed through. Wow. It sounds like, you know, as I'm reading it, I'm like, those are like Pink Floyd lyrics. <laughs> They're uh, Kafka-esque. Yeah. There's no escape for this character. Um, he's just being beaten down. Yeah, and she's got his number. She's got his number. There's, there's enough, she's got tricks upon tricks that are programmed into him. I'm her machine. She programmed him. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's a great little patch of lyrics. And that, you're right. Uh, it's very much like Pink Floyd, but, but in this case, I don't think because he was like, I want to write like Pink Floyd. They, <laughs> no, no, no. They just are. Yeah. I think when you have rage and hopelessness yeah. combined, it gets a Floydy. It gets yeah. a little Floydy. Um, yeah. Yeah, just one of my favorite little passages in any song, probably, lyrically. Because I can relate. <laughs> and I think most people can. It might not be your mother, but something makes you feel like that. Indeed. He should do this uh, as an encore. This should be his encore. <laughs> uh, yeah. You, everybody sing along. We, we don't know this one. Sing along. You know it. We all know it. <laughs> Laura calls me when she needs a good fix. Oh, that's the word that he hisses. Yeah. Great. All her questions will get sympathetic answers. And man, even when you don't want to, a lot of times that's how you get through a conversation like that. Yeah. I know you're right. It's not fair. <laughs> I should be so immunized to all of her tricks. Love immunized. Yeah. Um, I like the fact that immunization in this doesn't work because that's how I feel about vaccines. Um, <laughs> I'll pile of shit. Linda was <laughs> right about you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get sympathetic answers. I should be, I should be so immunized to all of her tricks. She's surviving on her second chances. Sometimes I feel like this Godfather deal is all wrong. How can she hold an umbilical cord for so long? And of course, when you hear umbilical, you that is, I think, the first time you realize, oh, it's his mother. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was a crazy girlfriend. Oh, this is much worse than I thought. Because he's in this until she dies or he kills himself. <laughs> Now, here's a question for you is, are we meant to see a double meaning in cord? I don't think so. I think it's just an umbilical, umbilical cord, but I was like, is it supposed to also be a musical cord? No, not this time. Well, it is spelled the way musical cord is spelled. Right. In the lyrics. Yeah. Which just seems like a cute thing. Yeah. And uh, it's, that's like a move that for my money is unnecessary. Yeah. The song is very, very good and clean and clear. And I don't think you need a pun <laughs> to really drive it home. And you're not Prince with the funny spellings. So, no, no, no. If anybody's not Prince, <laughs> it's this guy. Yeah. There's a good list of people who are not Prince. And if there was a top 10, he comes in at least number two. Yes. At the lowest. Yeah. Um, what about Godfather Deal? Sometimes I feel like this Godfather deal is all wrong. Oh my goodness. It's, well, it's definitely family you can't get out of. It's definitely an offer you can't refuse. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's that. I think it's like, there's, you can't go anywhere. Yeah. You can't just leave. You can't just walk out of the mafia. Yeah, that, yeah you're right. That's what it is, is... It, it feels like you can't get out of the, this relationship until one of us is dead. Right. 
and you can't even bank on it being her because you know, right. you're going crazy. Because <laughs> you're a rock star who drinks and drives. <laughs> and who Horatio Sands did a hilarious impression of once. Oh, more, did you more like of that, that sketch. Love it. Yeah. I liked Fantastic. it. Fantastic. I liked it. I liked it fine. And then I loved it because of Maya Rudolph. Yes. Her I don't think because for some reason, like they were like, oh, you're, he's playing Billy Joel. So he has to just sing Billy Joel lyrics all the time. Right. And it's like, what? That's, that's not how that would happen. <laughs> yeah. But nobody knew, nobody knew where to hang their hat on like a Billy Joel impression. Yep. So, I just sing fucking parts of songs. <laughs> Great. Good enough. And since nobody had a Billy Joel impression, they're like, this is going to be Horatio Sands. <laughs> Yeah, like, well, who's uh, Chunky? Right. Get Raj. He'll do it. Yeah. Yeah, Maya Rudolph emotes like a mother in that scene. Oh. She gets so mad. And then it's, is it Amy Poehler who just loses it because of Maya Rudolph? I have to watch it again, but probably. All very important, but I'm just remembering how funny I found that sketch. Oh, the best. And the only other thing, I'll just say this and then we'll get back into the meat of this mean little song. The only the other thing of Horatio Sands that I came to appreciate was when he played Carol. Oh, yeah. You didn't want to like it. I didn't, but I did. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's as stupid as you think it is. It, yeah. But then you're like, well, I have to be okay with that. Yep. The entire character is him going, I'm Carol. That's the character. That's the character. I maybe even did it better just now. You might have. Uh, it's, I have so much respect for the balls to put no effort in yep. to a catchphrase for your character. Yeah. Okay, you, I'm going to play a lady named Carol. Well, what's her thing? Like, what does she say? <laughs> I'm Carol. <laughs> Great. See it rehearsal. Uh, that sketch, which I believe is the safe word sketch. I think maybe. Philo Buster. Popcorn. Yeah. Oh, God. Let's see. <laughs> so perfect. Oh, check out our other podcast, Half Remembered SNL Sketches. <laughs> <laughs> About six of the episodes are the same sketch being remembered different ways. Oh, yeah, it's like Rashomon. <laughs> <laughs> First Rashomon, where we're remembering the cheerleader sketch. Uh, <laughs> done everything. What am I supposed to do? Uh, How can she hold an umbilical cord for so long? That's like a Shyamalan move. Yeah. And they're like, you thought the song was this, but the ta da. <laughs> oh, the whole time it, they were living in the in a village. The village. Yeah, and her Isn't mom. The village. And her mom is afraid of water. Yeah, the, you know some of his least pop least regarded movies. I find something to enjoy in all of them, but some of them are ridiculous. Yes, we watched The Happening recently. Yeah, and man, it's real bad. Yeah. But there are some moments in it where you're like, oh, that's wonderfully spooky. And I have never seen that before. Yeah. That move. Um, it's just sometimes he makes a wrong turn within a great thing. Yeah. But uh, Unbreakable, I saw that in a theater and my wife hated it. And I looked over next to me and there was a guy with a Flash t-shirt. Uh -huh. like, oh, I could talk to this guy. Yeah, I only saw him there. I've never seen him since. And we had a great conversation about how great that movie was and how wrong my wife was. Perfect. So fantastic. Uh, it's my favorite. Uh, certainly my favorite of his movies. Um, fucking great. Even including the big one. All right. Yeah. That's awesome. Which we rewatched. We rewatched Sixth Sense like a week ago. And uh, it's hilarious that we didn't know he was dead. Because <laughs> the whole movie, like nobody talks to him. Yep. 
nobody sees him and uh except the little kid and then at the end like you were dead the whole time like oh we sh really should have noticed that. <laughs> that's that's how he's a genius and then i will also say Haley joel osmond's character when you rewatch it you're like oh damn he's worried about this ghost that's bothering him on top of everything else that realizing he's dead you rewatch it and contextualize it contextualize it with just another ghost that's hassling him but for some reason ah it's great it's yeah every other ghost just kind of goes by walks through the room or something and this ghost is like i want to talk to you yeah he had the bad luck of running into the ghost of a child psychologist <laughs> yes <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. We'll great, get, that way, it's a great comedy. I'll get we'll get back into it. But I also the other thing I will say about that movie is uh, the way they enjoy a glass of wine in the very beginning before the bad stuff happens. Oh yeah, kind of makes me laugh now, just because it seems so like over the top. Look, they're a family. I don't know. Something about it is very phony. Everything yeah, yeah. else in the movie not as phony, but that one scene. And he acts kind of tipsy, and I'm like, it didn't seem like you were drinking that much. Yeah, yeah, yes. There's a lot of uh, phoniness early on. All right, that's Not to mention Bruce Willis playing a child psychologist. So you'll have to listen to that in our other podcast, but we'll reveal the name later. Oh, great, Mister. All right, I think I got to say the uh, umbilical cord part. You did. Nice work. <laughs> um, here it gets very mad here and I think this is the thesis statement <laughs> I've done everything I can what else am I supposed to do I'm her machine and she can punch all the keys she can push any button I was programmed through and then it turns into the Beatles a little bit yeah a little call and response Laura loves me even if I don't care that's my problem. That's her sacred absolution. If she had to, she would put herself in my chair, even though I faced electrocution. She always says I'm the best friend that she's ever had. How do you hang up on someone who needs you that bad? I take it back. That's the thesis statement. Yeah. Um, the saddest line in it, contextualized this way. Now, I'll tell you something about the song in a minute about, because I'm not, I don't always get things. But <laughs> the saddest line is, if you imagine any parent saying, you're the best friend I've ever had to their kid. Inappropriate. Sad, inappropriate, yeah. a hallmark of narcissistic personality to say we are friends. Yeah. Um, and there, you know, and there are parents who do it to manipulate you. Yeah. There are parents who do it to make themselves feel younger. Yeah. Like, oh, me and my daughter, we're friends and we buy the same jeans. Mm, no. Don't do that. Yeah. Hers don't look ripply. <laughs> yeah, just because you had her when you were 17 doesn't mean you're friends. Yeah, and and it's then that mom is occasionally is flirty with a guy friend. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've seen that in real life, not just in movies. Oh, Sam, for yeah. sure. Not my mom, to, to her credit, I won't, but we had a neighbor lady who was I guess truthfully kind of young for having had kids probably had kids when she was 17 and damn it she was flirty with teenagers it's not great yeah and uh but it's a 100,000 times worse when it's a, yeah. a dad who's flirty with teenage girls yeah I think the worst uh, part even, about, yeah the worst part about it is I never closed the deal no. Oh, well, <laughs> look her up. 
You don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now, are you being sarcastic saying it's way worse or do you think it's way worse if a dad is that way? Yeah, it's way worse. Why is it worse? I'm curious. Um, if a dad, I think when uh, like a mom is flirty with her child's teenage friends, it's more often than not, they're pumping themselves up in some way. They wanna feel like they're still attractive or hip or cool. And when a dad does it, it's because he's a creep who wants to fuck teenage girls. Okay, okay, okay. Sweeping generalization, but. Yeah, you know what, because I was gonna say, well, you know, sometimes when, and of course there are exceptions to the rule, but if you were to do it as a statistical truth, yeah, I think you're, yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of hor a lot of like, most serial killers are guys. And then somebody will always go, well, this one lady. Yes, you're right. She did it. Right. And right. The fact that there's an exception proves it's a rule. And good honor, girl power. She did it. She killed a bunch yeah, of yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. She killed the glass ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic joke. That was wow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. That's really funny. Um, I also want to note uh, an electric chair, another thing referenced in other songs of his. Yes. Remember when I found you there alone in your electric chair, told you dirty jokes until you until smiled. You smiled. Yeah. Which is a, a very weird image. Yeah. So for um, finally just going. <laughs> but this last part feels very much like the Jewish guilt paragraph. Yeah. She calls him all the time, tells him horrible things, bothers him, pushes his buttons. But then this is the part where she would put herself in my chair. Even though I faced electrocution, I'm the best friend she's ever had. How do you hang up on someone who needs you that bad? Yeah. Ugh. That's a great line. Yeah. And, and uh, the answer is pretend you're going through a tunnel and you lost reception. Oh, we solved it. Yeah. Bruno, you hang out with Billy Joel, probably. <laughs> Backstage at the Grammys, right? Yeah. Billy Joel hasn't been to the Grammys in 35 years, probably. Yeah. I'm the, I'm the worst therapist, by the way. I've been in trouble with my phone. Pretend you're in a tunnel and you're lost reception. All right. We'll see you next week. Don't even, don't even need the rest of the hour. Uh, now, here's how I could be kind of dumb. Um, so I listened to the song, liked the song, look at the lyrics. It was only until you said so. I was like, oh, it's about his mom. Okay. So I didn't get that till today. I was still thinking uh -huh. about a lady. And, uh, and even umbilical cord, because I was thinking he was being... Maybe, uh, the metaphor? Yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously, it's still a metaphor, but... Yeah. The, you know that kind of a relationship the reveal yeah and uh that's just me being silly because it's it's right there it's right it is right there um i do think it's a i hope it was intentional that he was like oh, i'm gonna make it sound like it, this is a shitty girlfriend and then i'm gonna pull the rug out by revealing that it's mom you know what i would bet this would be uh, i'll say guess because we don't bet on the show gambling's not allowed um, no, no. um my suspicion is like i said this song was spewed onto the page initially and yes. i would suspect that then he found a nuance and it became oh it's about a girl and then it's about mom because he's a smart man and he you know he's crafty he can craft things and as far as billy joel crafting a turn in a story. Good effing job, mister. Yeah. And the only reason I'm not cussing is because he already did in this song. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Nowhere else in 12 albums. That's the, the other thing that tells you how personal this is. Yeah. The one song about his mother. Oh, buddy. Yeah. Here it comes. Because you're, you're, you're pissed off and you're pissed off in a way that's hard to express. I don't think I've told, maybe I've told you the story or not, but when I, when you grow up, you have to go to your parents. 
Thanksgivings because you live at their house. And mm-hmm. then you move away and then you have to go back to the damn house and right. have the Thanksgivings. And one year, my friends were doing a Thanksgiving and we were like, oh, you know, we could just hang out with each other. This person could cook. I could cook. We could eat the things at the table. No one would. We don't. We can eat the things we like with people. Yeah. We like. So yeah. my mom was Nobody like, and my mom was like, so what time are you coming over for Thanksgiving? And I was like, well, this year, this is what I'm going to do. Oh. And I was under the impression that she was going to go, oh, that sounds fun. <laughs> Whatever I thought she was going to say. <laughs> and she, man, hard guilt. Oh, yeah. And I ha- I'm very, uh, so I'm a mix of a lot of things. Uh, Scottish, Irish, Swedish, by the way. Mm-hmm. I realized plays a big role in my personality because when I oh. hear how Swedes are described, because that pissed me off so much and I felt so guilty that I was like, yeah, that's right. You won't be seeing me that day. And I didn't call her either. Oh, boy. Because I was mad because I was like, it's not right for you to make me feel this way. Yeah. Whereas a reasonable person might have went later went, well, you know, it's Thanksgiving. But I was like, no, I am my father's son. I'm locking in. <laughs> oh. And, and do I feel guilty? Yeah. And I'm going to savor it. <laughs> right. I'm going to let it feed me. <laughs> yeah, that's how I <laughs> dealt with that. Yeah. yeah, I'll do whatever I want and not enjoy it. That's right. <laughs> uh, that's the trap. Yeah, now our new thing with Thanksgiving is we don't do it. Oh, that's better. Because Mary Jo can't eat most of the stuff. Right. One, one year I made a turkey and I realized, so I got a giant dead turkey in my fridge for a month? Yeah. This is over. Yeah. And people are like, yeah, but leftovers. No. I never got on that train because it's the biggest, most physically painful dinner you'll have all year. So the idea that the next day you'll do it again is crazy. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, make a sandwich and put turkey and mashed potatoes on it. No. No, I don't want to get drunk the day after I got drunk. Right. Eh, sometimes you do. <laughs> mm, well, it's been a while. Yeah. Uh, Let me ask you a question about this song. How soon after hearing the song the first time or the second time did you go, oh my God, and did it hit you that it was like reminded you of personal stuff? (laughs) Well, I think the first time I heard the song, I had not really processed the personal stuff. Okay. I don't think I had fully realized that uh, my relationship with my mother was different from anybody else's. Yeah. I just thought, oh, they all behave like this. And somehow everybody else is handling it well, and I can't. And then it was many years later when I was like, oh, mine was bad. Oh, yeah. And other, a lot of other people's moms are pretty normal. That's and they all do a little of this. Yeah. Um, but some of them only do this. Ah. Um, but as soon as I heard the first time I heard the song, I knew it was about his mother. Yeah. Cause that umbilical yeah. thing happened right away. Um, I did a little tiny bit of research on this song and it became clear through Google very quickly, um, that it was about his mother because he was coy about it for a long time. Uh, and then his drummer, Liberty DeVito told somebody in an interview, yeah, it's about his mother. <laughs> whose name is Rosalind, um, which was like, oh, this obviously that won't work lyrically. Yeah. And he said, oh, why do you choose Laura? And he said, oh, same number of syllables as mother. I was like, oh, okay. And then you can sort of go back through it and uh, sing it, just sing mother wherever there's Laura. And it really makes sense. Yeah. Lord, yeah. You know who <laughs> my my wife's mother was like that. 
Yeah. My wife's mother was like that. She was a absolute horrific narcissist and, uh, and other kinds of abusive as well. Sure. A, a nice mix. Yeah. There's never just that. Yeah. And, um, and she had the unique relationship. So you, you got the, the rough mom wants too much from me as a son. And she got the version that a mother puts onto a daughter, which is a, a another expression of that same nightmare. Yeah. Right. Well, Lord, that is fascinating. And it's fascinating how, how long I was like, nah, it's about a girl. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a very good, uh, uh, he writes both sides of the fence pretty well. Yeah. And if there was no umbilical cord in there, you might just walk away thinking it was that. And you'd be like, oh, he's being kind of mean to that girl. Yeah. He should just break up with her if he doesn't like her. Yeah, how hard could it be to break up with a lady? It's not like it's your mom. No. Ah. And then, yeah. And surprise, Shyamalan. It's, it is still endlessly entertaining on Twitter. You'll post mom said stuff. So obviously you found a way to have an adult relationship with your mom, which is and good on you, by the way. Yeah, it's a, a ton of work and therapy. Yeah. Um, but yes, I've come to view it as a performance art <laughs> that she is doing unknowingly. And I am watching knowingly. Like I've chosen to be audience ah, okay. participant. So, so I'm going to watch her do this crazy rant. So you go back a distance from it. Yeah. So that it doesn't have to continue to be yes. a dumb wound. It also helps to move to a different coast yep. <laughs> and teach her how to text instead of call. Things like that. Um, but yeah, distance is key. Yeah. Whatever kind you can create. Yeah. Well, I got uh, I got all the distance I could ask for from my folks now. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't get much uh, further than that. Yeah. <laughs> the great beyond. Now, with the problem is you have to stay alive now or else you'll... <laughs> You'll be back where you were. Oh yeah. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is the fun Billy Joel lyric podcast we're having. <laughs> All right. So I got a clue for you. Uh-huh. Um, I feel like uh this is a boy with a six pack in his hand. That's right. Uh so it's uh my life. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the Ballad of Billy the Kid. Ballad of Billy the Kid. I went, I went. Historically accurate and great. Exactly. Perfectly captures the American West how it actually was. <laughs> Both yeah. east and west of the Rio Grande. Yeah. Which runs east-west. <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> so in the middle? In the middle. <laughs> It's it's on, like, it all takes place on a sandbar. In the Rio Grande. In the Rio Grande. Now, contextualized like that, that's an interesting song. Right? All the stuff he did, he robbed all those places. <laughs> it's a very happening sandbar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm glad we already talked about that song, but I still, if it comes on on the old Spotify, I'll listen to it every time. Oh, it's fucking great. Yeah. Still makes me laugh. It still makes me think, oh, should I go out and buy steaks? Still always. But I, it's still musically great. It's musically great. And it's got that old Westy, uh, the clip clops. Yeah. The horse hooves. We didn't even mention the sound effects in that song. Oh, yeah. yeah. Fucking great. And then great to do the clip clop sound effects and then go a oh, boy um rode a boy from uh, oyster bay long island yeah <laughs> he missed a trick from just he, what he should have had is the clip clops fading into motorcycle oh man don't bruno mars don't tell him that <laughs> he will do a whole album just to get that in 
it's yeah, re-released, remastered. Ill George Lucas, that mother. Oh, <laughs> like wait, why where did this track come from? Oh boy. Well, wow, why is this song twelve minutes now? Oh. this is a great song. I love it. Yeah, that is a good. It's a bummer. Yeah, <laughs> but it's great, and it is one of the few songs that makes you feel for him. Yeah. And a song should be- A lot be of them make go, oh, you're not that great. <laughs> and a song should be a bummer sometimes. Absolutely. The Bare Naked Ladies, the silliest band in, a, in the world sometimes. Lying in bed just like Brian Wilson did. The Old Apartment, those are both bummers. Yeah, there you go. If, Got them. If those Canucks could be a bummer, Kid from Long Island could be a bummer now. That's right. And he did it in style. That's right. The uh, <laughs> song I picked is uh, When in Rome. When in Rome? Yep. Boy, I don't even know if I could hum it. Yeah, I don't know if I could either, but I was looking at the lyrics. Is this from the uh, River of Dreams? It is not. Where does it live? Give you an, it released in 1989. Stormfront. Stormfront. Oh, of course. Yeah. In Rome. Give and me a hint. About what? About how it goes. Oh, we were going to have to listen to it because I couldn't tell you. What I liked about it, what I liked about it was when I was, when I do my research for the picture game, I'll look at a lot of different sets of lyrics. And I was looking at the lyrics to when in Rome and I was like, kind of like these lyrics i haven't listened to it in a bit hopefully we like it but at least the lyrics will be interesting to talk about all right i support that so yeah i came at it from that i literally do not could not hum it I'll, but hey you know what i i bet if you were at a party with billy joel and you went hum when in rome he'd go cannot do it yeah sorry bud Want to hear that, Piano Man? <laughs> when, he might even say, when in Rome? Was that one of mine? Are you when sure? Rome, it just puts on the harmonica harness. And you're like, no, no, no. No, no. No, I think it's this. Oh, I hope it turns out it sounds like, I hope it turns out it's the when in Rome lyrics, but you're like, no, it is Piano Man. It is Piano Man? Oh, God damn it. It just changed the words. <laughs> he wrote his own parody song. Uh, hey man, do you want a trivia question? I would love a trivia question. Um, I saw a good piece of trivia that you might already know. Hopefully you don't. But he did reveal in an interview once upon a time who he wrote the song Big Shot about. Lord, that's a great bit of trivia. Ain't it though? Yes. Um... And it was based on a real night out with this person. And the person is famous. The person is famous. He wrote the song not from his own point of view, though. He saw someone else having this experience with their partner, where their partner was being a big shot. And that person was super annoyed about that person's behavior. So he was like, I'm going to get in that person's head and write a song about how mad they are at their yeah. fucking drunk partner the, who won't shut up. And listen, Big Shot's a great song. That's really cool that it was written like that. Um, oh, is it? A, was he a stand-up comic? No. Okay, so I'm going to say it's written about Steven Spielberg's first wife. <laughs> you write about the last part it is a first wife oh okay cool yeah. it is a fellow musician who is much more uh well regarded and famous than billy joel is oh uh david bowie mick jagger and bianca jagger oh oh lord that makes so much sense we went to dinner or something with them and just saw mick having a very hard time 
uh, and being embarrassed by his drunk, coked up wife. Oh God, I like ah man, I'm gonna write a song where I'm Mick Jagger. <laughs> wow, I can, yeah. Thinking about what I know about her, I'm like, yeah. Probably tough on a night out. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, well, that one, I was so happy to run across that piece of information. That's glorious. I had no idea. I had no effing idea. Nor did I. Fucking great. Wow. Lordy, well, good job, everybody. We did it. We ended on a high note after the sad, sad song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that was the other thing, by the way, in picking next week's song. I was like, well, whatever song we pick shouldn't be a bummer because we did that this week. That's a good call, I think. Yeah, so we should at least have variety. And uh, what well, would be a bummer some other time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. I'll be yeah. a bummer between podcasts for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All week long. That's right. And uh, hey, hey, and you folks at home, you go be a bummer too. See you next oh. week. <laughs>